Have you heard of Rise Education? Innovate your campus with hybrid, market-responsive degrees. You can quickly add career-ready undergraduate programs directly into your existing course catalog with enrollment marketing support, student success monitoring, and industry collaboration. Amazing! Head to rise.education to find out more. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. This is Dr. Joe Salustio here for another episode of Ed Up, um, this time with half my face numb. So uh, you may be hearing that I sound a little bit funny. I had to go to the dentist. I, I had a filling. Uh, each time I, I speak, I'm either drooling or chewing on my tongue. But we're going to get through this episode because there was zero chance, and I mean zero chance, that, see, I just bit my tongue when I said zero, um, that I was going to cancel on my guest today. Too important, uh, and I love interviewing. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to interview community college presidents because of the work that they have to do to prop up our country right now and skilling the workforce of tomorrow. Let me take a breath and suck my drool back in. Uh, Yes, this is actually a professional higher ed podcast, ladies and gentlemen, but it's also real. And I know some of you have had dental work and gone to work and had to trudge through it. So I'll do the same thing here. Um, But I want to take you on a journey. I do want to say this and and a quick shout out to my staff at Lindenwood University, where I am chief experience officer. Um, My birthday was on Valentine's Day and they uh, played a prank on me. Um. They put 2,000, you know, ball pits, you know, do you take your kid to like urban air or something like that? And there's ball pits. They, they made a ball pit inside my office somehow with some, a cardboard that was all folded up. And so when I went to open my door in the morning for my birthday, uh, 2,000 balls flew out of the door, um, which was a diversion for the real prank, which was they put a, a cat, uh, put a speaker, hit it in my office, and it was a meowing cat that would go off randomly throughout the day. So I'd be on a meeting like I'm about to have right now with our guest that I'll introduce in a second, and I'd hear meow, and I would go, what the heck is going on? I'm rifling through my desks, I'm trying to find it, I'm turning my chairs over, um, and uh, for two days that went on and drove me nuts, uh, but they thought I was getting upset, so they revealed, though I would have let it gone forever if I was the one doing the prank to somebody else, I would have never revealed. Um, Pranks are all about how far you could take it, in my opinion. But we're not going to prank our guest today, but shout out to my to my staff. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to bring him in right now. He's got a lot to say about what's going on in the state of Oregon. Here he is. He is Dr. Tim Cook. He's president of Clackamas Community College. Tim, welcome to the mic. Thanks so much, Joe. And I have to say, um, shout out to your staff as well. I, uh, th- I, it sounds like people I get along with really well. I love pranks and I love opportunities to, to, you know, give people a hard time. So that ball pit one is one I might have to um, borrow. It was uh, it was a spilling effect, if you will, just uh, they flew everywhere. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it was. Uh, but uh, you know what? I'm with you on that. It's, there's nothing more important than having fun with what we do. We serve students, got to have fun while we do it. Can you talk about Clackamas Community College? Where are you? What do you do and how do you do it? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. So Clackamas Community College has been around since 1966. We're in Oregon City, Oregon, which is just south of Portland. Um, It's the actual end of the Oregon Trail. I think that's just a couple miles from our college. And so there's just a lot of history um, with, uh, with our college, with the state. We've got three campuses, um, that one in Oregon City, we've got one uh, a little further away in, Mil- in Milwaukee, Oregon, and then another one in Wilsonville, Oregon. About just under 20,000 students headcount, um, which equates to about uh, 5,000 FTE students. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, the changing nature of students as, as that goes. And so, Well, let's do that now, because I, I, that's such an important yeah. topic, right? Um, we, I, I, I have to go through too. Like, here's how many students we have, but here's how many equivalents we have, full time equivalents. Mm-hmm. The students different. The students changing how they experience higher education. What are you seeing, Clackamas? How students journey? Yeah, some some big differences. Um, you know, before the pandemic, we were, you know, we were finding we had probably close to seventy percent or so of our students that were part time. Um, you know, and, and for a number of reasons, that number has gone up to closer to 85% now. 
And that's, again, I always tell people not because they necessarily want to be, it's because that's what they can afford. That's the time they have, you know, they've got families and they're, and they're working through that. So it, it makes a big difference on completions. It makes a big difference on how we provide support and, and everything for those students. So that's a, that's a big shift. Um, you know, the other one, uh, or a few other ones, I guess, you know, I'll just jump in. My um, concern I have is the just higher number of basic needs uh, that students have. You know, again, a few years back, we were seeing like probably most places across the country need for, you know, more food banks. And so all of our campuses have food banks that are just, you know, decimated every week. And, um, and then uh, the numbers of higher numbers of home, um, housing insecurity or just homelessness for our students. So it, it's, uh, it's changed the way that we, you know, our foundation works. It changed the way that we are offering support for students. I mean, we, you know, scholarships are, are important and tuition and books are important, but we're, you know, we're giving out money for electric bills and for, you know, gas and, and things like that for students that are, you know, close to uh, dropping out because they don't have a place to live or they can't, you know, can't get to class or something else like that. So that's a big shift that I think a lot of people that were either worked in, in education or went to college years ago don't quite get, you know, that that shift. That's a fact. That's a fact. I, I exactly. agree. <laughs> I agree. Um, also, maybe it was less acceptable to have uh, socially acceptable to have all those things and communicate them. Right. Like I, I think about I think about my father and if had I gone and said, hey, I'm having mental health issues or I'm having mm -hmm. this or I'm having that. I think he would have called me a wimp and sent me back on my way. I, I think it's uh, more socially acceptable now that if you have issues, if you if you're a student and you have concerns, voice them. Now, what that does is puts tons of pressure on the institution to be something that you weren't built for and managing. We know how to do education, but how do we do all these other things? Can you talk about balance a little bit? How do you balance all that? Yeah, that's a really great point. And I'll just I'll just say and I just thanks for bringing that up. The, um, you know, five, six years ago, our food bank was uh, in a closet, you know, kind of out of the way. And, you know, it wasn't there was a social stigma to even, you know, accessing that or counseling. And our new student center, when we design that, counseling is prime. I mean, they've got prime real estate. People see them. And our food bank is probably three times as large with an outside entrance and in indoor entrance. And you see it, you know, and you can have access to it. So it's a whole different um, shift in, in how people are accessing these, these pieces. So balance, for sure. Um, we talk a lot about Clackamas, how we, you know, communities are middle name. And we really partner wherever we can. And certainly in, in these areas of um, kind of social services or, or support, it's become a big part of what we do. One of the um, more exciting partnerships that we developed in the last year is a, an entirely free health clinic um, moved onto our campus. They uh, A few years back, they'd approached us. They were in a kind of dilapidated building that they needed to move out of and wondered if we had space. And, you know, of course, the silver lining from the pandemic is we were starting to really think differently about spaces. And we did. And, you know, we invited them on. They raised the money to really put the clinic in. And so now our students have um, it's a great partnership because our students have access to free health care. And, and our health science students, um, nursing, medical assistants, phlebotomists have access to practical experience, which is helping the clinic as well. And the third win out of the win, win, win is you know, community members who maybe never stepped onto campus are coming, you know, because the, the clinic's there. So they're getting exposed to that too. So, you know, that is something that probably people haven't, you know, weren't thinking about. I remember years back, we had health centers on campuses that were funded by student fees and those all went away. You know, those were budget cuts years ago. And so to get something like that again is, is really critical. Yeah. Speaking of uh, getting to a clinic, um, I might need to do that. Uh, because I've chewed half my tongue off uh, because my, my guest co-host, she, she was busy, but she's here now. She's Sonia Khan. She is the VP of Innovation at Lucian. Sonia, I've been dying for you to get here because I'm, uh, and Tim has been hearing me. I, I'm fumbling and bumbling as I'm chewing my face off right now, but I would love it's you the to- drool. It's the drool that's distracting, Joe. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> everywhere. I wish, I wish people could actually see what we're seeing right now. No, I don't. Okay, no, no, I'm just kidding. Yikes! <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me again. I'm sorry for being late. No worries. No worries, but I want to pass it over to you for any questions you have for Tim. Yes, so I did come in here a little bit late, but I automatically loved what I was hearing. Uh, we at Lucian 
take the the concept of nurturing the whole student very seriously. Uh, I will tell you, we're always trying to figure out like what are the factors that actually uh, equate to what that means? Is it food insecurity? Is it financial insecurity? I cannot believe you guys have figured out a, a way to get students all access to healthcare that easily. It's fantastic. But in your mind, it's completely epic. So in your mind, tell us what are your, let's say your top five factors for what it means to address a student's full well-being. Top five factors. Okay. So um, if we're addressing their whole well-being, we need to do things like make sure our tuition and books and everything are affordable. So open education resources, low tuition, I would say that's kind of first and foremost. We need to make sure that we're offering programs that um, are meet the needs of when our students are available. So whether that's fully online, whether that's hybrid, whether it's nights, weekends, um, we need to look at that. Um, we need to, let's the third is probably the, the basic needs so that, you know, they've, they can actually come and, and, you know, looking at Maslow's hierarchy, actually be successful in school, be fed, be housed and, and do well. So we're trying to, trying to figure that out. That's three. Um, we need to have, um, gosh, we need to continue to eliminate barriers for students to actually get into their classes or find their classes or just navigate, you know, complex systems. And, you know, they're, that's a, a mixed bag. I think we've made some progress, but there's still some more work to do. And five, I, I think, you know, um, I would uh, actually, I'd probably move this up higher if I were to think about this list further. We need to make sure that everyone feels like they belong. We need to have an environment that welcomes everybody and, you know, let's, let's anybody and everybody know that they can be successful. I, I'm a first generation college student and that's been critical to me, you know, to my success was feeling like this was a place where I could be and, and be successful. And I, I am still committed to that, to everybody that, you know, they, this is a place that they can come and achieve their dreams. What do the judges think about this? Uh, let's go to the judges to see how we did on the top five. Bullseye. Oh, phew. I was sweating that one out. <laughs> yeah, you, you nailed it. And, and clearly community is like a key piece of um of what you do and how you lead uh so if a student has that direct connection and feels like they have a sense of strong belonging at an institution how does that show up in their academics how does that show up in their retention can you talk a little bit about that yeah absolutely so um retention is probably the the primary one right they they see themselves there they're um they feel accepted they're likely to stay or likely to persevere and and, and continue on there um, you know, additionally, they're, if they feel like they belong, they're more likely to um, have conversations with their uh, professors, with their advisors, they're likely to, you know, seek out help and assistance and not feel like they're just a, another number, you know, they're, th that this is a place that they're, they're proud of and that they want to stay at. So it's, it's not just a, you know, it's not just a great idea from a, you know, values perspective, which is one of our primary values. It's, it's a great idea for, you know, the bottom line. I mean, you know, if you have a strong sense of belonging, not just for students, but for staff, you know, faculty and everybody, then, you know, you retain employees, you have a happier place that people want to be at and just is a, is a big draw overall. So it's, Tell it's them really like it is. I love no, I one one quick one quick uh, note while I can while I feel like feeling is coming back to me. Um, retention, Sunny brought up retention, and retention has so many layers to it. We use it as a blanket term, right? Like if you're if you're talking about retention in an Ivy League and you're talking retention at a community college, you're not talking the same language, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, we think we, when, when we say it out loud, we, oh, yeah, we're, we're retention and persistence. So we're all concerned about moving students to the next term and keeping them. But the work that community colleges have to do to retain students, to keep them going, is much deeper, in my opinion, than maybe schools where there's a little bit more privilege and so on. Um, the student type is different, uh, student, for, uh, students of color, first gen, uh, so lower resource students. When you have to pay that electric bill and you're thinking about paying that electric bill for that student that's real like that's if i can't get that electric bill paid how am i going to make it to school uh president cook and and so i've got to drop i i can't be here if i can't do this so talk about your team a little bit the the retention team you have the how, however you have them structure or whatever you call them that is really yeah. hard work it is hard work yeah, and, and early in my career, I, I did a lot of that. My um, I was a counselor and worked in um, success and retention for years before I kind of moved up in administration. So it's important work to me. 
Um, so we um, we have a care team. Uh, we call it the, with the care team at work. And so I I would I would preface this by saying, you know, yes, students have a number of barriers. Um, my message is always, uh, you know, I want us to at least have tried to to see what we can do to help them overcome that barrier. It, it when I run into students or people that you know um, had to drop out for some reason, and I find out that you know that we didn't you know reach out and try to offer some sort of resources, that's where I get concerned. So, you know, all of the early alerts that we can do with, you know, faculty really recognizing that, certainly making students and staff aware of, of all the resources available, uh, those pieces. So, you know, the care team's job, which is, you know, made up of, you know, um, counselors and staff and faculty that, you know, really tries to, you know, reach out um, early on and, and make sure that we have that environment is really critical, you know, and they're, they have, gosh, they've had a tough job, you know, um, for, for years, they've had a, a tough job. And as these, you know, issues get more and more deep, uh, it's, it's becoming more of an issue. I'll give you an example from last week. Um, we had a, a rather large cyber attack uh, last month that really disabled. No way! We did. It was, it was still digging out of it. It's um, something else if you want to talk about. But one of the biggest concerns there was where we're going to be able to get financial aid out on time, which, you know, for students, that's make or break. Is it, can, I, can I pay my rent? Can I buy food? And so our foundation stepped up and offered emergency grants like on the spot. And we had, you know, just dozens of students that, that needed something to, again, get them through until we could we could get that, those financial aid checks out. That those types of things I'm really proud of that, you know, we look and say, you know, the primary goal is to help students stay there. You know, there are other reasons why they need to leave and and so on. And we always want to make sure that they're, you know, feel welcome to come back. But uh, but I, I don't want people leaving because they weren't aware or didn't have access to, you know, potential resource that keeps them in. I, you know, um, not to gloss over the student part of this, but uh, <clears throat> you brought up the cyber attack. This is a real issue in higher ed. One thing I'm sure of is that I'm way less prepared to, to ask about it than Sonia Khan is. So I'm going to let Sonia ask you questions related to that because she's way smarter than me about it. <laughs> I don't know if I'm way smarter, but it is something that we talk about a lot in, in the SaaS world is that uh, cybersecurity handling those attacks uh, when you're on your own is very difficult, but being able to do it when you're part of a SaaS um, platform, you have like the ability of having a large network of people who are uh, ready to jump in and make sure that you are protected. And it feels like these threats are happening obviously more and more. They're targeting campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me, I guess, about the panic that was there and how you guys rallied to, to get around it. Yeah, it's something else. Um, and, you know, to your point about having resources and really thinking this through that, you know, takeaways for me are really um, the way I've, I described it to all the presidents in Oregon when I was um, telling them about it last week is, you know, imagine you wake up on a Friday morning right about this time or, you know, a couple hours later and you don't have access to any of your systems. How do you, how do you want to call? Inconceivable! It's challenging. It's hugely challenging. And so, um, you know, we, we uh, fortunately had, um, you know, a great IT team, but beyond that, really great teams across the campus that really, really rallied and started, you know, problem solving. We were still down um, for about two or three days where we couldn't, you know, we couldn't offer learning or instruction. And we're, you know, we're still digging out of it, but most of our systems are back up. That's, that's a, you know, true credit to our campus and the work that everyone did to try to figure that out. I mean, there was Early on, we we're like, how are we going to pay our employees? And, you know, in the financial aid issue I mentioned and a number of things that there was just heroic efforts to really figure out some of those systems. But had we not had um, outside resources, had we not had, you know, um, the internal staff and then, you know, and then a plan. And I, I tell everybody, if you don't have a continuity of operations plan, you know, that's like priority number one to think about how would you, you know, really get these things up and running again. And, and I'll just say, I mean, that, you know, we were in a number of areas, you know, doing that on the fly, like how, you know, how can we figure that out? We couldn't, we couldn't, we didn't have access to email. We didn't have access to our website, to our learning platforms. I mean, so we were literally posting things on social media or on our rave alert system. And that was the only way we could communicate for several days until we, you know, got an alternative website up. And so this there's lunacy. It's a, it's, it's a whole different kind of man, you know, crisis management, you know, to, to kind of get through that and, and talking to people, colleagues that I know that were down for much longer. I mean, I feel pretty fortunate that we didn't, you know, it wasn't as impactful as it could have been. Yeah. That business continuity is, it's, it's a real thing. It's amazing how well you guys rallied 
I love the the fact that you guys were able to do that emergency funding. What a great way to showcase to your students that you care about them and that you're uh, when that student leaves your institution, they know they can come back because they have a high level of trust that you care and are ready to to support them. Um, yeah. Terrifying, but what a great story of of rallying and people coming together and make it work. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, pretty impressive. What happens next, though, Tim? Like, what's the what's the debrief on it? Like, you know, you're, you're you've got to look at this and go, okay, this yeah. happened. What do we need to do now to prevent it from happening again? Because I think higher ed and Sonny, you know better than me, but I think higher ed's really easy targets for cybersecurity attacks. Like, we're we're not built for technology wise to prevent them completely. Um, well, we're under under resourced, and you know, and I mean, I think that's you know one of the reasons why you know we um, we can't we can't afford all of the protections everybody has. But yeah, we're so we're as we're getting through this and getting everything back on. That's the the after action plans. Really, what did we learn? How can we you know better protect ourselves? So we're doubling down on some of our um, you know software and some of our, our programs that are you know early alerts and and let us be aware of that. We're certainly. Um, got the attention of the campus about uh, phishing attacks and scams and, and really the importance of, you know, password protections that we, we've been doing, you know, all the two-factor authentication, all those things before, but now, you know, people are paying attention to to what's coming through. And so that's been helpful. And as I, as I mentioned, it was probably the biggest wake-up call for all of us about to getting that continuity of operations plan together. So we're working through those um, and, you know, and just figuring out kind of how, you know, hopefully not when this happens again, but it, it's entirely likely that it could, that um, we are ready to respond and ready to respond quickly and get get these systems back up as, you know, as quickly as we can and, and work out. But it's, it's I, I don't want to downplay it. It's a ton of work. And, you know, and, and people were working around the clock on weekends to, to get some of these things back up to, to respond quickly. And it, it just, you know, it sucks the life out of everything else. You can't, you know, you can't move forward on anything else while you're, while you're doing it. So it's, it's been, you know, about three weeks or so that we've, it's been all cyber all the time for us. Attention. Did you know that Rise Education is trusted by 85 plus schools in over 30 states? Grow your revenue, boost your enrollment and retention through easy and fast integrations to enhance the student experience it's program sharing designed for 21st century colleges remember 80 percent of students rate their rise education courses as good or better than their in-person courses rise education innovate your campus with hybrid market responsive degrees head to rise.education to learn more yeah i can feel it can feel crippling. Uh, it, it is one of the main drivers of the value of SaaS is that, you know, taking mm -hmm. that, even that those three days down to a matter of, of, of hours, mm -hmm. because you'd have an entire group of people willing to lean in and, and support. Um, and it's sad that uh, higher education keeps getting hit this way. It's that student data is so precious and they know it and they know mm -hmm. that they can hold people ransom with it. Yeah, fortunately, we um, do not believe that there was any student or employee data compromise. That was the really the, the great part about all this as we got into it. They weren't um, we don't believe they were able to access any of that. Fantastic. Interesting. Yeah. And and th this is like an issue of our of our of our days. Right. Especially as technology is advancing very fast. Um, the student is is also accessing information more quickly. We talk about AI all the time, Can, but but we don't talk about AI in the student context as much as, much as we should. We talk about it. Um, we talk about it uh, global, like more like globally, more like you know out there as in um, um, the institution. How are we going to accept AI? Um, mm -hmm. But Sonia, I want to ask you and defer to you to ask the questions here because I know you're dealing with this. And and then Tim, I, I really would love for you to talk about how students are experiencing it. Uh, too. But go ahead, Sonia. Yes. So uh, I one of the, the key things that I do here at Elucian is I lead our incubator team. It's a little small startup within Elucian, all focused on uh, playing and, and doing some of the, the future forward work that we're not able to do as part of our regular work. And of course, it has a strong AI first mindset. It has to because look at the world these days, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yesterday, it's been all the news, but Sam Altman, that Interesting man who is that doing dude. that that little guy in the corner, right? He um, announced Sora. Have you guys heard of it? 
I, I was reading about it this morning. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the visuals for them? Just yeah. a few. It was it was startling. I mean, yeah. amazing. It, I, yeah. I mean, like so, like like all things, it it is amazing. But there's also the other side of the spectrum, right, where people are wondering. Well, if it can do that, what happens to the music or uh, to the uh, film industry? What kind of disruption is happening? So, and my daughter, just so you know, is uh, going into art school to be an animator. And <laughs> we're having conversations with her in this world too, to say, you know, how does the future workforce look like? And as an educator who is responsible um uh, who's responsible to their students to make sure that they are going to be viable in a future workforce, knowing that there is this potential of AI to do some phenomenally disruptive things, uh, not always good in the marketplace. How do you feel you're you're actually being able to prepare your students adequately for this future where AI has potentially automated a lot of things? Yeah. That's a that's a great point, a great discussion. And I would say when I talk about, you know, cyber sucking out all the air out of things, I mean, we were really having these conversations about where are we looking at AI in the curriculum? Where are we looking at it, you know, for supports for the college and everything? And, and we'll get back to that. I mean, it, that's certainly for, for sure. The, um, the where I land on this, uh, and I was at a um, presentation a month or so ago where or a couple months ago, I guess, Futurist was talking about, he's like, you know, AI may not take your job, but somebody who knows how to use AI will take your job. And so I, I've been sharing that with folks, you know, that that might be like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And this is the rest. And I was like, you know, this is another powerful tool, actually one of the, probably the most powerful tools that we'll have come to us in, you know, generations. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's not hyperbole to say this is changing everything. And so, uh, you know, I saw, yeah, I see that SOAR, is that what it's called? I, I said this morning and I, and I, my first thought was, wow, I can see why people feel threatened by this, you know, in, you know, that are creators and that are, you know, in the film industry, TV and, and the rest, I can definitely understand that. But I, I had the same thought. I was like, this, this could really be quite an, an amazing tool. And what, what will this look like? My son is also, he's studying graphic design in college right now. So we have this conversation all the time. I'm like, how do you think this is going to impact the work that you do? And, and and get all and get along that and it's just really this interesting conversation is there you know all these tools are getting better and better and and and, and at this and you know what kind of work there will be i um i i guess i think about this like a lot of things you know it it's coming and you know we're it's not like we're going to stop it and so how do we really prepare uh, our faculty and how do we prepare our students to really um, I, I'm, embrace might be too strong of a word, but certainly to really figure out where these where these tools are going to be helpful and, and how to how to navigate them. And as we you know, as we all know, our students are like way ahead of us on this way anyway, as they always are, right? <laughs> you know, they're they're using these and not always for good. And so, how do we you know how do we help them understand you know the the rest of this? I, I personally find it um, quite exciting. I you know I think it's quite interesting, and and so I do tend to to look at it, and, and I you know I try to be an early adopter and play and 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 try out some of these things, but um, helping, you know, helping the campus get, get on those is something that we really are, you know, need to spend a lot of time and resources doing. Yeah. Do you, do you feel yourself wanting to steer your students um, to be stronger in their critical thinking, knowing that AI is there and it's likely going to grab onto those use cases that are very, um, uh, manual labor intensive pattern recognition, those kinds of things. In tech, we always say that with the surge in AI, the the next uh, best coding language is English. True. Yeah. yeah, it's it's basically like how well it's now in the future going to be more about how well are you able to um, creatively solve a problem or or think of something or prompt an, an output instead of crafting it. Do you mm -hmm. see yourself investing in, you know, maybe some of those um, you know, older uh, degrees that were under fire a while ago, like communication and English? These are things that are going to be surging. Do you see yourself having those discussions with your faculty? Yes. And, you know, and, and it, that I think is part of that larger conversation just in general about the value of higher education and, you know, and, and, 
in, in the conversation about why do you need brick and mortar, you know, when all these things are the rest. And, and I, I think, you know, what I come back to all the time is what really makes us different is that ability to critical think, you know, be critical thinkers, to be able to be um, social, you know, socially adept and, and have emotional intelligence and work through those that will always, uh, I think, always have, you know, the advantage over, over these powerful tools, you know, what, and how can we really, um, help our students be thoughtful, be good consumers of that, really understand, be critical um, of all those pieces. I, I, I guess in the, at the end of the day, that's what sets us apart uh, as, you know, as institutions and, and what we're doing is the ability to really help our, our students understand these tools, but, uh, but to critical think wherever they can about them. Are the kids using AI? I mean, kids and adults, community college, right? Are they using AI or are they coming in with their own tool sets from what your faculty are saying? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, um, and, and I say not always for good. I mean that, you know, the concern and it's not unlike when it, I, it, it's, it's different, but I, I equate it back to, you know, when that conversation a decade or two decades ago, when, well, we can't allow cell phones in the classroom. That would just, you know, there's, that would be so disruptive and they're, they have access to all this information. I'm like, yeah, they do, you know, and that's, we just need to recognize that. And, and, and how do you have it? And so, you know, students are, you know, using it to write papers or to, you know, to come up with, with assignments and the rest. And they're, you know, they're in the, uh, it's getting harder and harder. You know, people want to, you know, it's almost like an arms race to figure out tools to, to catch plagiarism and the rest. I'm like, again, you know, how are we designing assignments? How are we designing, you know, curriculum that really uh, brings this in and, and recognizes, um, the, you know, what Sonia said, the, the fact that, you know, critical thinking and really utilizing all this, you can do some, some great things. So that's, that's the shift for some people that are more like, oh, we just need to kind of, you know, find ways to, to fight this or, you know, to recognize it. I was like, no, that's going to be a losing battle. We need to really figure out where we can harness it, where we can really show people how to, how to use it effectively. Yeah, I got to tell you, so I, I experiment a lot. So I'll, I'll, I'll take something I'll have, I'll have like Claude. I like Claude. He's my, Claude's my favorite. Uh, write, write an article from something then I put it, you know, it's AI and then I'll put it through AI detection. I won't, I won't bring up what, what, uh, mm -hmm. what tool just to see if it picks it up to see if there's any, and then I'll write something similar to see if it picks me up. And so there's a lot of false positive in there. Um, then I'll run it through undetectable AI, which is a program that like humanizes all of your writing and then try it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so just to test the systems and a lot of them are not working the way we intend them to. Right. Um, right. Which makes it even harder to, to deal with this problem. And then I the other day I came across uh, uh, Instagram post for turbo learn AI. Okay. Sweeping across college campuses, turbo learn. So I go there and I, and I upload my dissertation. It says upload a document, upload my dissertation, a hundred, 150 pages, right? It breaks down my dissertation in all these different parts, calls out my theoretical framework, gives me a, a, a you know, key findings, but it does it in a way that you would expect. And then it makes a hundred flashcards and uh, 200 quiz questions based on my wow. dissertation, just like within three minutes, bam. Yeah. So then I'm taking my quiz questions of my dissertation. And I'm getting everyone wrong. And I'm going, wow, I'm learning about myself right now. Uh, I should go back and read that sucker. But the point is, is that boy, isn't it going to cut down? The first thought I had in my head was, boy, going back to school is way different now mm -hmm. than it mm -hmm. was. And so I can, I could hack my way if I wanted to not cheat my way, hack my way yeah. by making the time I spent on research way faster. Writing would be easier. The, so the time constraint of college can be reduced if we embrace AI tools and embed them the right way. What do you think about, what do you think about that? I a hundred percent. In fact, now I'm intrigued to go back and, and do that with my dissertation and just find that out because that's, that's really, really interesting. You can see if you get your own answers, right? You're saying? Yeah, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, but, uh, but you know, and I, I instantly went back to boy, what, what, what a difference that would be even in, you know, researching and writing at that, at that level. Now, um, I, I was just going to say, you know, I, I don't use it a lot, but it saves me so much time. I'm, I've got my state of the college address next week, you know, and I've got my communications director that helps and, and a bunch of people put things together, but you know, the initial prompts to really pull some of that material together and then, and then outline it and kind of think differently about it saves me probably hours of time, you know, that I normally in the past kind of start, you know, like you would, you know, an outline and do all, all the rest of that. And then, so I, I have more time to spend then on, you know, how I want to really organize it, how I want to think about it, the message I want to get across, 
and less on the, you know, the technical kind of uh, putting it together. Um, gosh, maybe it was before the holiday, our Phi Theta Kappa chapter, you know, our honor society, uh, as students often do, you know, kind of last minute said, hey, would you come and give a keynote speech to us? And I was like, of course, <laughs> you know, I'd be happy to. And, uh, you know, they gave me the topic and everything. I'm like, gosh, I've got, a, I've got a little bit of work to do. And I've got like three days, you know, how am I going to do this? You know, so I, you know, I worked on it. I'm with AI, got some prompts, got some different things to do. And of course, put it in my own voice because I, 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 I think I can tell when people are giving an AI speech and I, you know, and I don't appreciate that, but uh, it saved me so much time and ended up, you know, and what I liked about it is, you know, with students, I always try to do like popular culture. I try to bring in music, movies, all the rest. And, and so just, you know, prompting it to give me some relevant examples saved me probably hours and searching, you know, on YouTube and the rest. So stuff like that is, uh, you know, and those are kind of easy examples, right, that um, that we do. But in my day-to-day -day work, I'm looking forward to really when I can get to the point, you know, email is the bane of my existence. Probably like a lot of people, I get so many where I can where I can really trust AI to say, give me a summary of what I really need to look at. You know, help me, you know, help me respond to this. And because I feel like that's going to, you know, every day save me, save me time. So some of those basic things I, you know, I get excited about. Yeah, and, and I... <laughs> I love that you're you're leading with this um, this idea of embracing it instead of doing what we saw higher ed do a lot of this past year, which their initial reaction to this was to oh well we got to protect our students from cheating. Um, right. When you, when you come into something with that kind of view of this is a threat versus this is an accelerator, it completely changes the way that you you lead an institution. I love that you can ask it to write a keynote in the voice of Taylor Swift. Yes. Your students. <laughs> and that, that you're using it to summarize and you're trusting it to summarize um, your your emails and, and accelerating your workflows. And probably in the back of your mind, you're looking for numbers and stats that can showcase overall how much more productive your staff could be with something like this. These are right. all like the mindsets of someone who is ready to embrace responsibly uh, the technology. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I don't want us to be left behind. I mean, I, I mean, I don't want students to be left behind. And, you know, and we always need to, it's, you know, it's difficult to steer a larger institution. And so we have to be, you know, doing what we can to, to move forward on that. You, uh, you, you, you're a first gen student. You talked about that being important to you. I don't want to gloss over that point. You're serving a community college. You come with a, a, a unique lens as a first gen student, I believe. Can you just talk about that import? What does that mean to you to be a first gen student? And how does that manifest itself to your your leadership style and and how you look and serve other students? It means everything to me, um, and I and I'm I'm I, I talk about this all the time and and when I give talks. So what's interesting, I guess, about my presidency is I'm president of the community college that's five miles from where I grew up, and I did not go there. Um, in fact, my goal, probably like many people, it was a you know a kind of a blue collar town at the time. And my goal was to get out and uh, and go away and i did you know i um i ended up at a a, a local um liberal arts college about a mile from or about a, an hour from where i grew up because there was an admissions counselor that came to my high school and i was the only one that showed up and so she took me under her wing and um w became a lifelong mentor in fact she was on my dissertation committee you know decades later and you know she gave me uh, my first job at the college she encouraged me to get involved um, I would not be in this chair today if not for her and that, that support and then, you know, obviously many others along the way. So I think about, you know, kind of um, just any kid who's growing up and thinking, well, you know, do I have the chops? Do I have what it takes? Can I do this? And sometimes it's, you know, somebody stepping in. It's usually a faculty member, but somebody stepping in and, and saying, yeah, you do. So I, how it affects my leadership style in, in so many ways. Um, I talk to people and I say the most important thing we can do is to connect with our students and, you know, make sure that, uh, I, so my, the first day of a report, my whole day is blocked off. I'm looking for lost students, you know, that are wandering around. And I encourage everybody to do that. And then we all, you know, we walk them to where they, they need to be. And, and so they meet. Um, I wear a bow tie every day. And I've been doing that for like 15 something years. And it started out as kind of a thing on a whim and it became kind of a signature. So students, and actually most people in the community know me because I think I'm probably the only one, you know, who's wearing a bow tie all the time. So students will literally call out on campus, hey, bow tie guy, how's it going? You know, because I hate in videos and stuff like that, I encourage them to, to say hello. And and those types of things as a, as a first generation, it's going back to belonging, really, really doing that. 
when I hire um, or encourage, you know, my staff to hire, it's all about how do we create an environment where, you know, where we're helping people that maybe felt like they they didn't belong or couldn't, you know, um, couldn't do this to, to create a space where they really feel like they, they could succeed. So it's it's such a huge part of, of who I am. I, I say all the time, I, when I first started, my goal was to become a dean of students someday and, and, you know, be able to give back and help that. And, and my, my personal mission has been the same every time. It's just, it's the, the, um, the scope of it's gotten bigger. When I was like a counselor, I used to help, you know, individuals get through or classes of, you know, people get through. Now I'm really looking at larger scale systems at my institution statewide, federally, in some cases, nationally, in some cases about how can we eliminate barriers overall so students can be successful and achieve those goals. So it's, it's, it's been there from day one. It will be there until I probably long after I retire. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Sonny, any, any last questions for Tim before we give him the last two to close it out? No, I just, I, I think they are lucky to have you. And, uh, I, I think your, your inherent, like, uh, struggle that you had had as a first generation, uh, student goes a long way to be able to understand how to empathize with your students. And it's clear by the way that you lead, you are inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, love that. Um, let's talk about Clackamas Community uh, College. Anything you want to say? Open mic moment. No question. So pressure's on you. Tell us anything else we need to know about Clackamas. So a couple things I haven't talked about. We are. Um, you can't see it because this is a not a visual podcast. But I've got a um, a Zoom screen on behind of me. We're going out for a bond this next year. And I think it's, um, we've been successful with our last bond. So this is a renewal. It's not going to raise taxes, but it gives uh, us an opportunity to really plan for the next 10 years. So there's a lot in that about really re, you know, re-looking at existing spaces and updating those and looking at safety and the rest. But the the exciting one is where Clackamas County is, is the um, county, it's just south of Portland. And it's, it's, there's a lot of um, farming and a lot of uh, uh, agriculture, horticulture still in that it's, I have a fairly large um, district and it's kind of urban, suburban, but big rural. And uh, so we're going in on this, what we're calling Center for Excellence in Farming and really combining kind of, um, you know, advanced manufacturing and things that need to go into running, a, you know, kind of a generational farm. You know, these people that are inheriting these things from their parents are working, trying to figure out how they can do it. There's all sorts of really exciting things around precision farming and robotic farming. AI and farming is 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 amazing, <laughs> you know, to go back to AI. Uh, and we, we are um, going in on that with our partners in the county. And then the, the kind of the cool piece of it is, the local uh, extension service for Oregon State University, our land grant university, wants to go in with us and move on to our campus and partner with us in this. So we we see this as a kind of a game changer for the county to to really um, go in on all this. It's a it's a signature program for us. So that's that's pretty exciting. Assuming we're successful in November with our our bond campaign. The other one, um, we uh, like many people. I mean, our fastest growing population are um, Latinx, Latin A students. You know, we're, we're probably not far from being a, you know, Hispanic serving institution and our faculty have really stepped up. Our early childhood education program started offering about three years ago, a program entirely in Spanish. And um, we think it's the first ECE one in the country that we were aware of anyway. And they did it all online because that's what the students wanted. They were working all day, managing their, their childcare centers, and then they, they take classes online. The advantage of that is, and so we graduated our first cohort. It was phenomenal, you know, all, all in Spanish. A couple of advantages. One is that we we're getting folks coming now from New York, from Colorado, New Mexico, other places that are sending cohorts now to us to, to train. The other advantage is because we needed gen eds, we now have math classes in Spanish, English classes wow. in Spanish, some other general, general ed courses. We now have a welding program that's entirely in Spanish. That as, a, as a result of that. So some pretty, um, I think, responsive ways to, to you know, uh, look at, hey, this is the growth area for us. And, you know, how can, how can we do it? They, they all have long waiting lists. And, you know, so we're looking at other areas, too, where we can we can grow there. Those would be the two I'd highlight. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution, 25% of your population? 25%. Yep. Yep. And so we're, we're was probably- wondering. A few years out on that, but um, but it's it's trending so much that I, I don't think it'll be long. Tim, what do you see for the future of higher education? Yes, I see much more um, in what I would call intentional community involvement and collaboration. And that's a, a 
big part of our strategic plan is that we are always looking to see where we, so that example of the extension service is one of them, the volunteers of medicine is another one. Where can we intentionally collaborate with businesses, with um, a government and the rest to make sure that we're a vital part of the community? We don't ever want to be a place that's the best kept secret. We don't want to be a place um, that's sort of the, you know, the Harvard on the Hill, so to speak, that you hear about sometimes. We want to be the community's college that people feel like they can come on there and they walk their dog. They can come on and get their GED. They can come and get their transfer degree, that this is their place. And so I, I think the future, what will keep all community colleges vital um, as we look at, you know, uh, impacts like AI and just online and, you know, the rest is, is making sure that we have, we've done what we can to create a community within all that. So some people may never step onto our campus, but they, you know, they have opportunities. Other people will feel like this is, you know, this is their place and they come to regularly. Sonny, what did you think about this episode today? Oh, I loved it. Thank you for letting me ask about AI and get nerdy. But, uh, (laughs) but what I, but what I learned is, is, is the power of, of, of what you're doing with the community. I was going to write it down before I forgot it, but a place for you to be able to walk your dog, but also if you wanted to return and upskill and continually get something um, uh, better for your career, you have a partner where you walk your dog that is part of your community and it feels like home. Um, that's that's what I'm getting from this conversation. And I think it's beautiful. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that as it's snowing here in, in uh, St. Charles, Missouri, I thought, you know, that you want your community college to be the place where you take your kids sledding if you've got snow or you take right and as they they go hey you know what i'm going to take classes here when i get old enough i mean i think that's the idea right and that's why partnerships and and why community is usually in the description of a community college it's our right. middle name yeah 100 mm-hmm. percent. It, it's an open tell- door that you walk into versus having to um you know hope or entry into. This is something that is just part of your community. I think that's beautiful. Well, like anything else, um, when Sonia Khan shows up, things get better. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest co-host, Sonia Khan, she is VP of Innovation, Ed Lucian, and Sonia, I will see you in person for, uh, again, April 7th through 10 at Elucian E Live in San Antonio. I can't wait. And you're gonna have to do this with me in person. That'll be great. We have Eclipse glasses for you ready to go. I'm, I am ready. I will not be drooling uh, when I come there. I will make sure I get to the dentist beforehand. Uh, like today, I'm going to head straight to the medical offices and see what damage I've done uh, to myself. Uh, one person that has done zero damage here uh, has been our guest. He's your guest, and he is on top of his business. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the Dr. Tim Cook, and he is president of Clackamas Community College in Oregon City. Tim, did you have a good time on the podcast today? This, this was fantastic. You two are really great hosts. And I, I just, I don't think I've ever been on an interview by somebody that, you know, that, that had the, uh, the um, dental issues you had today and you, you handled it well. And I just, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you both. Yeah. It's debatable how we handled it. You handled it amazing. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. Have you heard of rise education? Innovate your campus with hybrid market responsive degrees you can quickly add career ready undergraduate programs directly into your existing course catalog with enrollment marketing support student success monitoring and industry collaboration amazing head to rise.education to find out more